This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Fiber optic intubation plays an important part in the management of a difficult airway and is recommended by many societies of anesthesia. It is primarily important for the management of the anticipated difficult airway, but can also be used to secure the airway in an unexpected situation. There are different techniques for both situations, the nasal and oral approach in the awake and anesthetized status respectively. The choice of the equipment and medication is primarily dependent on personal preference. This video will demonstrate a nasal approach in an awake patient with a difficult airway and will also demonstrate an oral technique in an anesthetized patient whose airway presents an unanticipated difficulty. Nasal fiber optic intubation is indicated when endotracheal intubation is required, but the patient has a known or anticipated condition that will render intubation difficult. For example, a patient with supraglottic tumor or an abscess in the neck region. Nasal fiber optic intubation is also indicated in patients with a limited mouth opening, for example, those with rheumatoid arthritis, cervical spine problems or a poor dentition. Fiber optic intubation may be considered when mask ventilation is likely to be difficult, as in patients with a body mass index of 30 or higher, a beard, abnormal neck anatomy, or an airway that allows only limited visualization of the laryngeal structures. Patients with two or more risk factors are particularly good candidates for the fiber optic approach. Lack of patient cooperation precludes using an awake technique even in situations in which airway management is expected to be difficult. In such patients, general anesthesia should be induced only by experienced anesthesiologists. Oral fiber optic intubation is indicated in the management of an unanticipated difficult laryngoscopy in the already anesthetized patient, provided that mask ventilation and therefore oxygenation are possible until fiber optic intubation may be performed. Nasal fiber optic intubation should be avoided in patients with severe maxillofacial trauma since the fibroscope or the tube may inadvertently enter the brain. Massive airway bleeding is a relative contraindication to fiber optic intubation and should only be used by experienced anesthesiologists. Gather the necessary equipment. You will need non-sterile gloves, a topical anesthetic with atomizer, 0.5 ml of 10% cocaine nasal drops which is used for vasoconstriction and local anesthesia of the lower nasal cavity, a 2 ml syringe with a local anesthetic such as 2% lidocaine for local anesthesia of the larynx and the proximal trachea, a water-soluble lubricant, a flexible armored silicone endotracheal tube with an internal diameter of 6 mm, a 10 ml syringe, an anti-fogging agent, tape and a ribbon to fix the tube in place, and a slit oral airway for the oral approach. The diameter of the flexible fiberscope should be between 3.7 and 4.1 mm. Discuss the awake technique with the patient and obtain informed consent before surgery, preferably on the day before the procedure. Give the patient an oral medication with mild sedative effects, for example 0.15 mg of clonidine by mouth 60 to 90 minutes before surgery. Explain each step to the patient. While monitoring the patient, provide 100% oxygen by face mask Administer 2 micrograms per kilogram of fentanyl intravenously and anesthetize the posterior pharyngeal wall with a topical anesthetic spray. 
Prepare the inferior nasal cavity by applying 0.25 milliliters of cocaine inside each nostril and close the patient's nose by pressing on both sides with your thumb or forefinger or ask the patient to do this. While you are preparing the equipment, be sure to oxygenate the patient adequately with a firmly applied mask. Thread the tube over the lubricated fibroscope and fix it with tape or with the appropriate adapter to the fibroscope. Check to ensure that the fibroscope is flexible and provides a focused view and then apply an anti-fogging agent to the tip of the scope. Connect oxygen to the fibroscope and provide 2 to 4 liters of oxygen per minute continuously. Stand above the patient's head and explain each step as you proceed. Hold the fibroscope near its tip in order to get the best feel for the instrument as it proceeds through the lower nasal passage. Direct the fibroscope parallel to the patient's nasal floor. By constantly keeping the floor of the nasal cavity in view, you will prevent upward movements of the fibroscope, which directs it towards a blind recess. When you reach the posterior nasal pharynx, ask the conscious patient to stick out her tongue. This maneuver makes it easier to advance the instrument towards the epiglottis. Simultaneously, lift the tip of the fibroscope, making a slight downward movement with the thumb of the hand that is holding the instrument. If a patient is heavily sedated, a tongue traction maneuver is helpful. At the supraglottic region, introduce 1 to 2 milliliters of local anesthetic through the working channel of the fibroscope while administering oxygen to propel the anesthetic into the area. Advance the fibroscope posterior to the epiglottis and through the vocal cords, taking care to avoid any direct contact with the pharyngeal and laryngeal structures. You can facilitate the advancement through the glottis by making a slight downward movement with the tip of the fibroscope. Understanding the difference between the trachea with its rings and its posterior tracheal membrane and the esophagus is important because sometimes the scope is unintentionally advanced into the esophagus. Inject an additional 1 to 2 milliliters of local anesthetic through the channel of the fibroscope. This stimulus will induce a cough reflex and disperse the local anesthetic within the trachea. Make sure the fibroscope remains in the proximal part of the trachea as only this area is anesthetized. The introduction of local anesthetic within the trachea and the supralaryngeal region will improve patient comfort and render the procedure easier. Alternatively, you can introduce the anesthesia by direct injection via puncture of the cricothyroid membrane. This direct injection technique is reliable, time efficient and easy to perform. To induce general anesthesia, we prefer etomidate 0.2 to 0.3 mg per kilogram of body weight in non-critical care settings. Note that etomidate is not the drug of choice in critically ill patients because it may induce adrenal insufficiency. Thus, another intravenous agent such as midazolam or propofol should be used in critically ill patients. The administration of a hypnotic before advancing the tube in patients without a severely compromised airway increases patient comfort and may also decrease the reluctance of an anesthesiologist to perform fiber optic intubation in an awake patient. After the patient loses consciousness, advance the instrument towards the carina. If the patient has a severely compromised airway, do not give any sedating medication, even for the insertion of the fibroscope. Place lubricant at the nasal orifice and on the cuff of the tube. Advance the tube using rotating movements. You may sense a slight resistance at the beginning of the nasal passage. Watch for the appearance of the tube on the screen of the fiber optic unit and place the tip of the tube 3 to 4 cm above the carina. Remove the fibroscope and attach the tube to the ventilation system of your anesthesia machine. If you find it difficult to visualize the larynx of a patient who is already anesthetized and have attempted conventional intubation without success, use bag and mask ventilation to maintain oxygenation. 
Then place the slit airway in a midline position. Ask an assistant to perform the chin lift and jaw thrust maneuver. Insert the fibroscope at the midline and follow the posterior wall of the oral airway. The end of the epiglottis can be easily recognized as you proceed. Advance the fibroscope through the glottis just above the carina as demonstrated previously. When the insertion of the fibroscope has been completed, remove the slit oral airway and advance the flexible tube using rotating movements while maintaining the chin lift and jaw thrust maneuver. After placing the tube with the nasal approach or the oral approach, confirm that the tube is in the correct position by viewing it directly through the fibroscope. It is also important to check the carbon dioxide signal on the anesthesia monitor as the tube may have become displaced during the removal of the fibroscope. Auscultation over the stomach and over both lungs in the mid-axillary line should confirm the correct position. Using adhesive tape, fix the tube onto the bridge of the nose or in the oral intubation onto the maxilla. Then fix the tape with an additional ribbon to keep the tube from being displaced. Stabilize an oral flexible tube with the previously used oral airway. Most problems occur if you deviate from the standardized procedure. With this technique, this means that the incidence of difficulty increases if you use a conventional stiff polyvinyl chloride tube rather than a flexible silicon tube. The latter follows the curve of the fibroscope more easily. The procedure will also be more difficult if you use a tube with a sharp bevel rather than a tube with a soft end and no bevel. It is very important to minimize the gap between the tube and the fibroscope since a small gap decreases the likelihood of difficulty when advancing the tube over the fibroscope, especially in the posterior arytenoid region. When performing oral fiber optic intubation, be sure that the chin lift and jaw thrust maneuver is adequate and be certain that the slit oral airway is the right size. In general, for adults a number 4 slit airway is the appropriate size. If the oral airway is too large, it will obstruct your view through the fibroscope as you advance towards the glottis. Minor complications include epistaxis, hoarseness, erythema and hematoma of the vocal cords. Provided that you adhere to a predefined standard procedure, Severe complications, such as extensive hematoma of the pharyngeal wall or aspiration, will be rare. In conclusion, fiber optic intubation is a standard technique for the management of a patient with an anticipated or known difficult airway. Fiber optic intubation requires adherence to a strict protocol that is dependent both on personal preferences and local circumstances. This video is intended as an introduction for those learning the procedure. Fiber optic intubation is best accomplished by those who do it as part of their daily practice.